This is American government for Monday, March 14th. Um, again, we're not meeting in person today. Uh, and I was going to originally divide today's lecture into two parts as I did last Wednesday's part A and part B on the premise that no human being should have to suffer through more than 50 minutes of me on a video. Uh, maybe what I'll do instead of dividing today's lecture up into two parts is I'll just talk faster and see if I can squeeze it in under an hour. Um, but let me remind you where we are and where we'll pick up on Monday, uh, Wednesday. So on Wednesday the 16th, remember, we're turning to Converse, Congress, um, uh, and uh, we'll turn to chapter nine in the uh, Wilson text, which is about Congress. And in the Nichols Reader, selection number 31, which is a distillation of Federalist Papers on Congress by both James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. Uh, and that, that's number uh, 31 in the Nichols Reader, which um, uh, uh, I list on the syllabus and which you can find. All right. So to pick up where we left off from last Wednesday. Uh, so we... We're, we're looking for the proper dividing line between the power and issues of the national government and the state governments in the constitutional system. To do this, we looked at what are the arguments for strong, vibrant local net government by Sentinel and Jefferson. Then we looked at the arguments on the other hand, the other side of the extreme, you might say, for a strong centralized national government under Hamilton and Federalist 11. And then, um, and then we looked at uh, uh, where the balance is struck in the Constitution, since the Constitution tries to have both goods. And so in the last part of uh, Wednesday's lecture, we discussed two limits on state power and authority within the constitutional system when the, the whole nation has to take precedence and where the power of the state either subsides or disappears. And that is one where the interest of the national government takes place. And of course, that has to do with things uh, like uh, a national commerce, uh, and um, and national foreign policy, military affairs, etc. Even coining money, obviously. So the states just don't, ha they have either no power or no role there, and we completely cede that to the power of the national government. But then as we saw in McCulloch v. Maryland, um, even when the power of a state may be legitimate like taxing, states have the power to tax. But that power is limited when it comes to an agency or the instrumentality of the whole uh, American people, the whole nation. So the interest, the first limit on power of the states in our system is when the interests of the whole or the uh, uh, of the whole nation take place over the part, take precedence over the part. And the second kind of limit on state power is when the fundamental rights of Americans are at stake, as we saw reflected in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, etc. And we'll come back to that question. Now, today we'll start with when should the power of the states and localities take precedence over the national government? And to some degree, um, Wilson in chapter three discusses different phases of the national state government relationship. And we'll talk about that at the end of the day's <coughs> discussion too. Um, but the primary, uh, and look especially both in my notes and in Wilson's text on the discussion of devolution, of returning uh, issues and power and <coughs> governance to the states, excuse me, after a century of of nationalization and the strengthening of the power of the national government, some people argue it's time to revigorate the states within our system and the localities. One of those individuals is Bill Schomburg, which is selection number 19 in the, in the Nichols Reader. And uh, William Schomburg, by the way, was one of my friends from graduate school, also a friend of David and Mary Nichols, the editors of this text at Northern Illinois University, still good friends with William Schomburg. And, um, and so, as you're going to see, Schaum, the reason I want you to read Schomber's article, and it fits in in this part of the course, is Schomber argues there are certain things that only states and localities uh, can govern uh, and, and, and manage well. A and as you'll see, ultimately, his arguments sound remarkably like a resurrection, as they are in some ways, of uh, Sentinel and Jefferson. Um, and moreover, so in other words, what you'll see is the argument that, that perhaps reinfusing local and state government, and which is, as we'll see, is part of the controversy of politics today, especially when it comes to school board powers over uh, COVID and, and other issues such as um, critical race theory and transgenderism or sexuality in general, where 
where you have a kind of movement of local parents asserting local control over local issues like school. That's that would fit into Schomburg's argument. Argument, and as you're going to see, that also points forward to um, uh, the difference between our two parties. Now, our two parties and the two-party system. We're going to discuss this later on in the course. Uh, are not like the kind of sharply divided parties in other countries, although, to be sure, we're in a period of greater polarization, some people argue, and I think there's some truth to that. Um, but but our two parties broadly represent consensus on many things. Nevertheless, uh, if you had to say uh, what issue tends to divide them and help give them the, to each party their unique identity, uh, it would be this great question of the division of power and responsibility between the states and national government. This old, boring issue of federalism, it turns out, is at the heart of our, our difference between our two parties today. So what Schomburg's article will do is make the argument for reinvigorating the states and localities and giving them more power in our system, not to diminish the critical uh, functions of the national government. Schomburg's not an anti-federalist, um, but, but he does argue that we would have a better society uh, and uh, 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 in some ways, a better uh, politics if the national, if the state and local governments had more authority over more issues in our system. And so we'll see how that argument uh, unfolds. So it, the beginning point of his article is that there's a different vision of community, what constitutes American community, and where Americans live out their their primary political life. Is it the national government or the states? Now, of course, it's both on one level, um, uh, and and but you'll see the argument for uh, in reinvigorating uh, local governments is is it's a re-echo of of that uh, Sentinel and Jefferson argument that that's where the values of local participation and moral fortitude and attachment primarily occur. So if you, if you're looking at the notes on page four, these notes are both the notes for last Wednesday and for tomorrow, March 14th, Monday, March 14th. Um, Here's how Chambre lines up the participants in this debate between Democrats and liberals who generally turn to the national community and the strengthening of the national government as our primary community, as opposed to Republicans and conservatives who generally today favor local community or state power and the private sphere to some degree over an expansion of the national government. Why? So let's turn to the the, and, and you'll see, by the way, this is kind of a history of our two-party system in Schomburg's article, and especially it's the history of the rise of what we call progressivism or liberalism uh, in national politics. Uh, Schomburg's article takes, it gives you the proper history, by the way, of, of why the democratic or the liberal or progressive view of politics came to um, uh, favor the expansion and ultimately uh, um well, the expansion and, and the size and scope of the national government over our national lives. And, uh, and, and so he traces that back to the progressive movement at the turn of the century, that is the 1900s, the 1800s, the 1900s, the beginning of the 20th century. And then the values of the progressive party and movement at the time of the turn of the century became infused into the National Democratic Party, first to some degree under Woodrow Wilson, but then came to dominate the Democratic Party under the New Deal of Franklin Delano Roosevelt with the rise of Social Security and the beginnings of the welfare state, but then especially the expansion of the welfare state in the 1960s under Lyndon Bain Johnson's LBJ and Medicare, Medicaid, and especially the aid to families and dependent children, what we call the family welfare, and many other aspects of expansion of the welfare state. That debate continues today. It continued with uh, the, the formulation of Obamacare, which added I mean, Medicare and Medicaid, Medicaid in the 1960s added health care to the national agenda. Obamacare wanted to increase uh, the scope of the national power and involvement in health care. And to some degree, uh, even the, the, the issues in the election of 2016 and 2020, and even pending issues today, um, have to do with the expansion of the power and scope. Add to that, for instance, concerns about global warming or climate change. Um, uh, or the Green New Deal, et cetera. And you still have the same issues uh, under behind the progressive liberal democratic view of community. And of course, what Schomburg was going to do is present the alternative and argue for that because Schomburg is a political conservative. But nevertheless, again, what you can learn um, from his article is how the divisions in our political system work today 
on this great question of the division of power between the national government and the states. So turning to the, the left side, appropriately, of the notes on page four, Schomburg uh, tries to delineate why liberals, Democrats, progressives locate the national government, the national community as the primary community for American life, because that's where most Americans. Rights mean the natu- the moral underpinnings of the, the national community in this understanding, or that's where the natural and civil guarantees that we enjoy Americans and should be secured and guaranteed by the national government. Um, and in some ways, uh, the argument is we turn to the national government to provide us as individuals with what we need through the expanded resources and programs of the national government, like health care, et cetera, or Social Security retirement. Um, the advantages, the moral advantages of that community, <clears throat> according to Democrats, liberals, progressives, are, first of all, <clears throat> that tr- treats all Americans as uniform throughout the whole country. Why should some Americans have better health care than another? Why should some Americans have more the right to marry than others? So it's the uniformity and, as you'll see, the equality of national rights that makes liberals, progressives, etc., turn to the national community and the national definition, empowerment, funding, and enforcement of um, of these rights because they are uniform and equal, and because uh, the national government, because uh, it, it because if you look at the states, there's a whole diversity of different programs and everything at different orientations, and the argument is. Only the national government can administer national rights uh, efficiently and, of course, with the unlimited, so to speak, unlimited, although don't forget we're headed towards $30 trillion of debt on the national level. Those resources may not be unlimited, but at least the argument is states who cannot coin money uh, and cannot, uh, while they can borrow money, um, uh, only the national government can coin money and to some degree has more unlimited resources of borrowing and spending and taxing. So. Uh, why a national health care system? Because the national government has more resources and can spend that money more um, efficiently. So for Chambra to look to the right side of the column now, he makes the argument then, well, perhaps this might be, uh, and we'll see the evidence for this, why he thinks this would be a good idea. So for Republicans and conservatives, the local community and the private sphere, to some degree, is the more important sphere where we as Americans discover who we are. Why? Because following Sentinel, following Jefferson, um, the local community and the private community is where we actually live our lives. We live our lives in neighborhoods uh, and, and our schools, our neighborhood schools, and we know the people in our in our area, just almost like Jefferson suggested in his tiny little unit of wards. And here are the moral underpinnings of the local or private community as opposed to the national community that conservatives and Republicans look to and wish to reinforce. So. Whereas in the national, or liberal, or progressive view, rights means give us what we need. In the conservative and local community, it means leave us alone to structure our lives so that we can uh, we can live our lives so that we in, in the freedom to uh, pursue the things that we want, participating in the community that makes local sense to us. So uh, where instead of provide us for what we need, and the, the moral message of the of the conservative or Republican community is leave us alone to decide what we need. But the national government is too big, too powerful. It's the same argument as Sentinel and uh, Jefferson make. Because why? There's a diversity of local needs. Perhaps not every part of the country needs uh, socialized health care in the same way that, that large urban centers might. And that liberty and self-government is more important than providing the things that you need. And that participation and self-reliance are the more fundamental American values that constitute the strength of American society. Now, what might be the evidence uh, for Chambra that an over-reliance on the national government and the welfare state might be leading to uh, a, a, an America that's less resilient and less strong? Well, he would argue that look at the problems that dominate our society, uh, crime, drug addiction, um, uh, um, uh, the kind of animism. Part of what he's talking about is there was a famous episode in American history and politics in 1967, uh, and psychologists went on to study this phenomenon called the Kitty Genovese effect. Um, that um, Kitty Genovese was a young woman who lived in New York City, and um, uh, when she was coming home one night, she was attacked uh, and raped and murdered. And it's estimated that over 37 people in different apartments and et cetera had watched this and had done nothing about it. 
And so this sparked a kind of a whole set of reflections from the 60s on that perhaps Americans were becoming less attached to each other as a community. In a way, Schomburg's pointing to that kind of thing and saying that, yeah, it's, not everyone wants to live in New York City where they'll step over your body on the way to the ATM. Um, uh, but in some ways, uh, he's some right about this. In Spartanburg, whatever else you might like or dislike about Spartanburg, if somebody collapsed on the sidewalk, most people wouldn't simply walk over the body on the way to their business. In a small local community, people feel attached to each other because they participate in each other's lives. So in some ways, uh, to sum up Schomburg's article, a reinvigoration of local community, what he calls the new citizenship, where people take responsibility for their schools and for the welfare of the people around them through either their community or volunteer organizations or through local government, might lead to a stronger American society and more resilient and self-reliant Americans. Now, again, our politics consists of both of these spectrums, and, and Schomburg is not arguing that we should dismantle the welfare state or that we should uh, uh, disunite the country or anything like that. Rather, what he represents is the other side of the spectrum from the, uh, 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 and argues for the strengthening of local community for much of the same reasons as we saw that uh, Sentinel and Jefferson did. And there, there may be something to that argument. So on um, page five and six of the notes, let me finish this section of federalism. Actually, this will be a fairly, a fairly short lecture, so I won't need to divide it into two parts. Um, so to summarize, and this is Roman numeral four, uh, I'm sorry, Roman numeral six on page five at the top. So of uh, the different understandings, so, so this is actually a discussion of uh, Wilson chapter three and how the different understandings of the state and federal relationship have changed. Um, the, um, so um, again, beginning, uh, what Wil Wilson tries to do throughout this system is not only to show why the question of the division of the of power between the state and national government is part of the tension embodied in our constitutional system, which I think we, we've seen. He also takes you through different historical understandings. So um, in general, the framers tried to create a, a system where a sovereign national government could preside over semi-sovereign state governments, both deriving their authority from the people. As we saw in McCulloch v. Maryland, the idea was that the national government be supreme, which is also reflected in the supremacy clause of Article 6, but limited, uh, with important as residual powers left to the states and localities. And the understanding of the relationship between the nation and the states has gone through several changes and controversies. And this is, well, I'll just walk you through Wilson's discussion of them. The first one, the first great controversy, which was in the 1820s and 30s, was nullification. Um, the Congress had passed certain tariffs on certain goods. And remember, uh, originally, uh, the whole country was essentially agricultural, but by the 1820s and 30s, the North had begun to develop its manufacturing and the South had remained primarily agricultural. So that tariffs on agricultural goods or tariffs on manufactured goods might benefit one part of the country over another. And, uh, and, there, and many of the Southern states then argued that a state could nullify, which means to cancel, uh, uh, federal laws that they considered unconstitutional. Um, and you could say, and by the way, uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, who was no friend of the bank or in national power, nevertheless uh, said to states that attempted to nullify federal laws, sorry, I'm the chief executive. It's my responsibility under Article 2 to make sure that the laws of the United States are faithfully executed. And, and if you try to interfere with the enforcement of federal law, I'm going to whack your heads. I'm paraphrasing. Now, you could say that to some degree, this idea of nullification uh, was negatived by the Civil War, which, of course, uh, was fought to prevent states from seceding from the Union. If a state can't secede from the Union, which is what you could say the Civil War settled militarily, but also constitutionally, then certainly a state can't nullify. Now, this issue of nullification is kind of fine, as we'll see when we summarize this section, kind of rebirth in the idea of sanctuary cities with respect to immigration law and even differences of opinion with respect to drug laws. So for instance, marijuana is still on the federal level a forbidden substance, yet several states have, um, have actually uh, legalized uh, marijuana and other kinds of uh, drugs. Um, and, uh, but does that violate federal law? Yes, it does. Um, to some degree, the federal government has let that slip because public opinion is changing on these things. But technically, yeah, 
in my home state of Illinois, where, mar- where recreational use of marijuana is legal, that still technically violates federal law. Why don't the feds step in and reinforce it and arrest all those people getting high in Illinois? Because they choose not to. But I do think that if a court case came up, which um, which which pitted sanctuary laws defying Im- federal immigration laws or, or state versus federal drug laws, the Supreme Court would probably find in favor of the national government because of the reasons of um, uh, the supremacy clause. The next phase after the Civil War was called dual federalism. The idea that the states and the nation have completely separate spheres of action, which led to the Supreme Court, for example, trying to find a clear distinction between interstate commerce, that is to say commerce on the national scale, and intrastate, that is purely local commerce. And you'd have to say that this approach uh, that the states and local governments and the state that the state and national governments have absolutely separate spheres of action um, was ended in the Great Depression and the New Deal. Um, and gradually over the ensuing decades, the national government began to absorb many functions that the states traditionally played by the states. And uh, during the civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s, the state governments became increasingly associated with segregation and the national government with progress and integration. The two levels of government began to share functions through the development of, and this is the next stage, really from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s on, what's called cooperative federalism, where the national government would achieve a national uh, aims by providing funding with various degrees of conditions and limitations. And that's where you should look at Link, uh, uh, Wilson's de- uh, de- discussion of the three different kinds of federal funding, categorical grants, where the national government give, 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 gives grants to the state for very specific and limited purposes, um, to uh, uh, block grants and and broader areas of policy, like for instance, Medicare and Medicaid tend to be operated through block grants, where a bunch of federal money is given to a state for a broad purpose, like like poor, providing medical care for the poor Medicaid uh, or or for the elderly Medicare, um, and um, uh, but with fewer ties, and. In the latter decades of the 20th and the 20, in the early 20th century, the impulse to return more autonomy to the states and localities, primarily because of Republican and conservative presidents and congresses, uh, again, as Chambra suggests, um, is called devolution. And this has reinvigorated the proper the question of the proper division between the national government and the states, not only on things like health care, abortion, and local and state autonomy. So. Uh, On the last page of the notes on page six, uh, to summarize, this issue is still alive and still at the heart of our national politics. Our politics still hovers and is shaped around this aspect of our constitutional system and appeals to both ends of the spectrum, a right and left Republican and Democrat, liberal and conservative, still dominate our political discourse. So for instance, the pandemic has in some ways heightened uh, many of these issues with, for instance, different states adopting different kinds and degrees of lockdown. Um, oh, and, and in some ways, both cooperating and resisting the federal government's vaccine mandates. On the question of policing, especially after the death of George Floyd and the uh, defund the police movement and the arguments against police um, uh, uh, actions in local and state governments, uh, the question of policing has become a, a live issue in terms of the, the, the difference between national and state governments. Immigration, uh, is is and continues to be an even more controversial policy with many states on both sides now um, resisting national government policies. Um, when the national government tried to limit uh, uh, illegal immigration under, under President Trump, etc., cetera, um, many states and localities, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier, reverted to sanctuary cities. Now that the Biden administration has sort of loosened <coughs> and, and opened up the southern border to more Unregistered or undocumented immigrants. States like Texas have uh, have tried, and Florida have tried to actually take stronger measures against illegal immigrants. That's being hashed out in our courts right now. Abortion is still, and in fact, may come to be an, a critical issue in national politics any day now. Ever since in 1973, when the Supreme Court decided in Roe v. Wade that uh, part of the right of privacy. Um, included a woman's right to choose to get an abortion, the right of abortion has been nationalized. Whereas prior to that Supreme Court decision, it was a state by state issue. Well, Texas and Mississippi have passed stricter laws that seem to go against the nationalization of the right of abortion. And and indeed, 
uh, with the predominance of so-called conservative justices on the court, it may be that very soon, by the end of this semester, the Supreme Court may overturn Roe v. Wade and return abortion regulation uh, to the states. Drug policy, as I mentioned before, is an area of controversy between the national government and the states. Healthcare, um, with, uh, again, progressives and liberals advocating uh, a single payer or even a completely national healthcare system like in many European countries. And again, education has become very controversial with issues like the uh, different uh, policies for the pandemic of masking, vaccination, et cetera, um, uh, or uh, uh, critical race theory or, or sexuality, where there's been more of a push for local governments and local school, uh, to, for parents to exert more control over local education. So the final thing I'd say about this material is this issue is not going to go away. This is, is deeply embedded in the DNA of our constitutional system. And most of the great issues that face us as a nation will and are and will continue to be articulated against and on the backdrop of this question of what's the proper division of authority and responsibility and power between the national government and the states. Not exactly the yawn or boring issue that most undergraduates think it is, but rather a gripping and engaging issue that engages us as Americans uh, uh, for the present day and into the future.